Hello and welcome to the first ever Wired Direct. My name is Julia Hardy and I am honoured to be the host today of this action-packed show. So today we've got heaps of game reveals curated by the team themselves at Wired. Uh, we are a tight-knit family of artists, storytellers and creators. And if this is your very first time and you've never heard of Wired before, don't worry because by the end of today, you're going to fully understand their DNA inside and out. So Wired Direct is basically their first chance to kind of tell all the stories behind all of these games so that you guys can find a way of getting these great adventures and great stories into the hands of gamers who are going to love them. So the games today are from all over the world and about subjects as diverse and wide reaching as gamers are themselves. And it's just well, it's just a really great opportunity to not only have some massive reveals, but also just to kind of celebrate the joy that gaming brings to everybody's life every day. First though, I'd like to invite some friends to the stream. Please say hello to the Wired team. Woo! Yeah! Hello! Hi, hello. hi! Big congratulations guys on setting this up. And I've seen the games that you're revealing tonight and I just wait to get started because they look incredible but you know before we kind of kick off into that i thought that you know rather than me explain what's going to happen this evening uh why don't you guys just have a go what's coming up well tonight we have announcements trailers more from the biggest bird and new developers new store items psychological thrillers <laughs> raving a website launch Oh, sequels. Yes, nailed it! Nailed it! <laughs> oh, well, get ready for an hour of some of the best indie games by some of the best indie developers. Let's get it started. All right. Are you settled in then? Got yourself some popcorn, a beverage or two, and you're kind of semi horizontal? best way to watch these things i find uh we've got our first reveal of the show and what i want you to do is just kind of take a breath just, just for a minute i want you to prepare yourself for something magical that's been lovingly crafted by some of the developers who brought us fable Behind every brilliant invention, there hides a brilliant inventor. Behind every brilliant inventor, there hides a brilliant team. But when the love for life and the love for invention are threatened by life itself. What do brilliant minds do then? That was your brand new look at Tin Hearts, and I'm very, very pleased to be joined by Kostas Zarifis of Rogue Sun, who's going to talk a little bit more about the game. I know you're going to be keen. Hey, Kostas, how you doing? Good. How are you, Julia? Yeah, I'm really, really good. I'm so excited to talk about the game. I'm not going to lie. Um, so let, I suppose we should right, calm down, first of all, Julia. Let's talk about the trailer. So we've just seen it. Tell us in your own words, though, what is Tin Hearts all about? Sure. Um, Tin Hearts is a rather genre-defying game, so we're 
you know, very excited for everyone to come up with their own interpretation of what it is. For us at Rogue Sun, when we describe uh, Tin Hearts, we like to say it's a mix between Lemmings and Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Just like A Christmas Carol, it has a pretty deep and engaging story. And yeah, just like Lemmings, I guess there's a lot of um, guide the little toy soldiers from, from point A to point B. I mean, if anyone's lived in a country where there's ants, I feel like this gameplay is going to be fully naturalistic. Yeah, right? just don't, don't step on them, though. <laughs> So I find quite interesting about this though is you know you're kind of coming out on like a variety of different platforms but also VR so how do you kind of how do you go about you know creating a game that works to the best of each of those platforms that must be quite a tricky thing to, to pull off uh yeah I won't lie it is it is a tricky <laughs> you're like oh my god so difficult <laughs> yeah uh, totally I mean for, for people who have been following the project for quite some time uh, the, the VR aspect of it is actually where where the project started so you know we we wanted to do something with a really kind of tiny sense of scale. Uh, we, when we were prototyping and experimenting, we we discovered that there's something really magical about kind of you know looking at things uh, with a small sense of scale around you in VR, and um, we wanted to leverage that as much as possible. But you know our DNA is very much you know from from kind of the Lionhead days. You know there's there's a lot of kind of storytelling in in our DNA. And, you know, as those kind of aspects started creeping in, we, you know, we wanted to 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 tell, you know, we want to have really meaningful and fun gameplay, but also tell this tell this story. And and we didn't want, you know, the the platform or the input method to be an obstacle to that. We want as many people as possible to to experience that. Um, so yeah, so 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 then as we started kind of uh, experimenting with other platforms, uh, you know, it's it's been a it's been a tough challenge, but. You know what we like to say is that we take respons the responsibility of solving that problem for you, and, and then you know who, wh whichever platform you play the game on, uh, for us it needs to be the best version of of the game, which is yeah it is it is quite tough, but I think we're going about it the the right way so far. So yeah, we'll see we'll see how it goes. It's actually quite refreshing to have someone say it's really quite difficult for a change because most of time I was like yeah it's fine, but actually you know, it's kind of nice. You sort of realise <laughs> the gravity of uh, the situation a little bit. Um, so. Obviously, you know, the game itself is, you know, a puzzle game, you know, by design, as well as having kind of this, you know, huge kind of elaborate story in it. Um, how do you go about the process of making puzzles for the game? And also, you know, what's the kind of thing that people are going to find a little bit different about that in Tin Hearts? So there's there's a lot of passion about puzzle games in, in the studio. Um, actually, one of the designers on, on the project, his previous game was uh, uh, The Room by uh, Fireproof <gasps> Studios just down the road from you. Um, yeah, which yeah, it sounds like you love and I do as well. So yeah, so it's good. I like to sort of point out some of the old kind of LucasArts games. I was literally you know, going to say exactly the same thing. I was like, why does that chicken go on yeah, a pulley? Right, like, what, with the why? Rubber ducky and, it makes yeah. no sense. <laughs> yeah, oh no. God, so, yeah. So, so we try to stay away from that sort of territory, yeah. and you know, I, I like to call it sort of fair kind of puzzle design. Um, so that you know, you, you have that bit of challenge, but then when you have that aha moment, it's it's very rewarding and satisfying. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and for me as well, I, I like to say we don't want to leave anyone behind. We we want everyone to get to the end of that story because it's it's you know it's quite the journey. It's sort of generation spanning. So, you know, the 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 puzzle is not there to to kind of be an obstacle for you. The puzzle is it's, yeah. it's it's there to entertain you while while you peel away. Um, the veneer of that of that cool story. Quite a few guys at Rogue Sun spent a long time at Lionhead. How would you say kind of working for that legendary developers kind of helped your vision now? Like what do you think you've brought forward from those Lionhead days? Yeah, I think sometimes we don't have an option to not bring forward the stuff from that True. kind of background. Um, you know, it's which is great, right? We don't want to push that away. It is it is our legacy and you know we for me personally and many many on the team, you know, we're, we're so grateful for for our time there. But I mean, you know, even beyond the sort of visual and kind of aesthetic aspects, for, for me, you know, the idea of Linehead, which, you know, even five years, I think it was yesterday or the day before, was like five years before the, since the closure of the studio. Uh, and I, But that idea lives on, I think, not just within me and other studio founders who, um, you know, who came from, from that studio. And I think the idea is to, to, to try different things and, you know, kind of take mm. things in unexpected directions. Um, and also, you know, that kind of Britishness, as, I guess, as well, which, uh, yeah. which you know, Tin Hearts being set in a sort of parallel Victorian era does have a lot of as well. So, yeah, Dickens so... Dickensian le lemmings. Exactly, right? So, yeah, so... <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, yeah, like I say, we, we kind of, we carry we carry that dream and that idea, uh, you know, Rogue Sun and, 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 other, and other studios that, that came about from, from, from Lionhead, which is, 
you know, it's a big responsibility, but also a pr mm. I think a privilege to, to be able to do that. Oh, Costas, thank you so, so much for talking to us. I'm genuinely really, really excited to get my hands on the game. And uh, yeah, can't wait to find out more. Cool. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, glad to see your reaction. And yeah, if everyone reacts this way, then all good. <laughs> <laughs> So that was Tin Hearts from the creative minds behind the Fable franchise. And I personally cannot wait to play the game. And um, if you want a bit more information, like if we haven't kind of sated enough of your appetite, uh, head on over to the Word Productions website and there's a whole load more details there for you to just pour over. So now we're going to switch to something completely different, which feels like a catchphrase that's going to happen all of today, not going to lie. Uh, I want you to prepare your hearts and faces because it's literally the cutest thing ever, this character that was brought to kind of luminous life by this sort of team of passionate creative legends. And my cheeks are already hurting from grinning too much about it. Um, it's basically got gorgeous visuals uh, and it's a complex puzzle game. And it it's sort of the thing that I think that if I was like trying to get to sleep after going raving, that I would kind of conjure up in my mind. This is the squidgy luminous joy that is Lumote. Oh my goodness, I absolutely loved that trailer. Let's find out a lot more from Michelle and Kyle from Lumen Awesome Games. Hi guys, welcome, how are you doing? Hey, how's it going? Hi. Yeah, <laughs> welcome, welcome. It's a stunning game, like stunning. I don't think I can make that word long enough to really emphasize exactly how I feel about it. Um, can you give us the lowdown though on Lumo? Tell us a bit more about it. Yeah, so as you saw, it's this like super glowy, game about this squishy cute uh, creature, Lumote, and you're going through this world and meeting the other creatures in the world and each of them has their own abilities. And you can like take control of them and use them to solve uh, puzzles so that you can get to the bottom of the world and face the master boat. And so all that red stuff you saw in there yeah. was uh, his control over everything. Throughout the world, you're gonna meet all these different little creatures and each of them has their own game mechanics. But depending on whether you Lumo control them or the master mode controls them, then they'll do different things. And uh, as you like slowly move through the game, you meet more and more of them and how their powers interact, uh, mm. then they, you can do different things with each of them as well. So uh, it kind of just grows from there where you're like, you have five different moats and you're like, oh no, how do I get them to <laughs> just get to the sledge? <laughs> um, can you tell us a bit more about the, like the creatures themselves? Like what was kind of the, the inspiration behind them when you're creating them? So the creatures are all, they're inspired by different underwater creatures. Like, we spend a lot of time at the aquarium. Oh, like, for work? We actually, <laughs> for work? Yeah, we needed to get that passes. Is yeah. <laughs> and go and see the, I love the jellyfish. Yeah, we totally yeah. had a season or an annual pass for the Vancouver Aquarium. That was lots of fun. There was like a bioluminescent exhibit for a while. Mm -hmm. Lots of different stuff like that. So a lot of the squishy elements came from that. <laughs> yeah. The original design for the the art direction on Lumo was actually everything was supposed to be crystals. So we had this idea. We're all programmers and we can't really do art. <laughs> so, <laughs> the guy who made like all this beautiful glowy stuff in the game. 
Uh, <laughs> so we had a lot of, uh, we were working with all these cubes and primitives and stuff from our original prototype, right? Mm. So from that, it was like, well, what if we have this like deep sea underwater crystal world where all these like living crystals and uh, it didn't translate very well. People are like, oh, it's just like a bunch of crystals and bejeweled, whatever, it doesn't matter. Mm. And uh, it was really hard to identify with. So we started exploring, well, what else is in deep sea caves and stuff. And obviously there's real meaty, squishy things down there, <laughs> not these like fake living crystal things. So we kind of just mush the two together. So there's like a little glass thing with like a squishy thing inside. <laughs> it's, I feel like you've learned a lot from being at the aquarium. We've got some squishy stuff, like we chuck some crystals in there. Yeah, it glows. <laughs> glows. <laughs> Looks cool. I mean, really, that's all you need to know. Is it fun? Yeah. Does it look cool? Yeah. Is it fun? Does it look cool? That's all anyone needs to know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you kind of, you mentioned a little bit, you sort of alluded to, uh, you know, trying to get to the bottom of this world, but like, what is actually, what's at the bottom? Why do I want to get, do I want to get there? I don't know if I want to get there. <laughs> you do want to get there. Do I though? But I can't tell you what's down there. Uh, at the start, you're in, the first room is blue because uh, as the first room's red, and then as soon as you get through the first checkpoint, it turns blue. And then every subsequent room as you solve it, you'll yeah. take over and it changes from master mode power to limo. And then um, you can zoom out and also mm -hmm. see your progress as you're going forward. Right, okay, so like, because you can see that you completed the rooms, whenever mm -hmm. you see the red in the distance, you're like, okay, that's somewhere I'm gonna be going next. <gasps> What's that? Oh, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> that's a progress bar built right into the game, right? Nice. No, no, no. That's really good because you always want to know where you're kind of going next. It's like mm -hmm. always in a game where you're like, oh, God, I feel like there's going to be something like terrible down around that corner. I can sense it. You can yeah. see through a window or something. I don't know. Um, so also, uh, yeah. as you're going forward, I mean, the mass remote is not happy. And don't you want to do the things people tell you not to do? So uh, always you should <laughs> push the red button. Always. Push the red button. Yeah. yeah. Bottom. This is why audience participation doesn't work on me. I will naturally just not get involved. Um, so I suppose the most important question to answer then next is, uh, when's the game coming out? Blue Mode is coming out this year. And that's all we can say right yeah. now. For real. <laughs> For real. That's all right. Get it out when it's done. We just want it to be as amazing as it looks. And however long that takes, just do it. Do you know what I mean? It looks great. I'm, I'm very excited. I mean, basically it's just how I assume if I was trying to get to sleep after being in a rave, you know, like trying to like calm myself down. That's kind of some of the visual things. Yeah, I would say potentially. We did definitely spend a lot of time in that uh, glowy sort of space. Like, did you go to uh, raves as well as research? <laughs> we really yeah, need to I, understand. I, I don't, we're not familiar with your show, so I'm afraid we weren't allowed to talk about, yeah, yeah. I mean, we did a little bit of raving as research. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's all learning about colors and lasers and glowy, squishy things. And lots of those are in raves. It's, yeah, yeah, it's research. It's fine. <laughs> Only write that off to your accountant. Hugging, yeah. Squishy hugging. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, well, look, parties. Exactly. Yeah, all You've good. invented the best game for your writing off your tax deductions. Let me tell yeah. you now. <laughs> um, amazing. Look, guys, thank you so, so much for chatting to us. And I honestly can't wait to uh, get my hands on it soon. It's going to be amazing. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Are you enjoying the show so far? Now is the time though for a fresh look at Martha is Dead, a game that I am very keen. Oh, I don't know if keen is the right word. I definitely want to know more about it. But I don't know if keen is the right way of describing it. Uh, it's brought to you by Luca Dalco, who we're going to be talking to in just a few minutes and his phenomenal award-winning team at LKA who brought you Tower of Light, which you should definitely know. And if you don't, you should go back and check it out. They are the masters of intricate details and, you know, multi-layered storytelling. So I am very keen. Okay, I'm keen. I'm keen to know more. Let's dim the lights, sit back and just, I really think you need to just take a very, very deep breath for this one. Will you tell me a bedtime story? Not tonight. There's a fall. We should have been there. Not her. Wake up. You have another daughter, you know? The one who is living, remember? 
Weaver? What do you say, Irene? Julius Dave, what are you babbling about? Julia, is everything okay? Luca Dalco of LKA is here. Let's catch up with him now to find out exactly all of the latest happenings in Martha is Dead. So, hey, Luca, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. So fans will remember Town of Light very, very fondly. And, you know, they're obviously going to be very excited about Martha is Dead. So can you tell us a little bit more about the game? Sì, allora, The Town of Flight eh, è, per me è incredibile essere qui oggi perché iniziò come, come un esperimento nove anni fa e dopo cinque anni dalla release ancora riceviamo email e review da parte dei giocatori, quindi questa è una grandissima soddisfazione. Marta is Dead è il nostro nuovo titolo, naturalmente più maturo, questa volta nato come un gioco fin dall'inizio, è sempre un thriller psicologico che inizia con un grande trauma, come può essere grande il trauma di perdere qualcuno che si ama profondamente. In questo momento siamo nella fase più intensa del lavoro perché vogliamo dare supporto al più alto numero possibile di piattaforme, molto eccitati per la next gen, per poter portare quindi una grafica di altissimo livello su console, ma anche molto attenti a cercare di avere un buon supporto per old gen e anche per PC meno performanti. Are the two games connected? You know, are they set in the same universe? Eh, diciamo che hanno molti punti in comune. Eh, Marta is Dead ancora una volta cerca di scavare nella, nella, nella psiche, nella mente della protagonista. Abbiamo una protagonista femminile, giovane, come in The Town of Flight, e ancora una volta siamo negli anni 40 in Toscana, quindi gli elementi in comune sono tantissimi, però ci sono anche degli elementi che distinguono molto i due giochi. E in The Town of Flight eravamo in un manicomio, e questa volta invece entriamo in un mondo di vita familiare, e, e inoltre sono molto differenti dal punto di vista di gameplay. E in questo senso sono due giochi veramente molto molto diversi. Possiamo dire che sono due mondi distinti ma che hanno delle grosse aree di sovrapposizione. I studied photography. I'm really interested to see how this is going to work. There's dark rooms. This is exciting. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that and why it's so important? Certo, sì, la, la, la fotografia è un elemento molto importante nel gioco per due ragioni. La prima è che andrà usato per avanzare nella storyline principale e andranno scappate delle foto per, per avanzare nella storia ora non posso naturalmente entrare nei dettagli altrimenti rovinerei e, ma anche l'abbiamo implementato anche per dare al giocatore uno strumento di piacere personale nello scoprire la fotografia come era negli anni 40 e per questo motivo abbiamo implementato un simulatore che non è un simulatore è duro, è un simulatore light perché in modo che sia comunque giocabile abbia un'alta giocabilità che però serve a far capire al giocatore le differenze, com'era la foto in quei tempi abbiamo introdotto tantissimi accessori per rendere varia l'esperienza e per permettere al giocatore di personalizzare al massimo l'esperienza di fotografare i soggetti che lui vuole sia per il gioco, ripeto, che per il piacere di fare So Martha is Dead is set in Tuscany uh, in 1944, just at the apex of the Second World War. And obviously LKA has some serious pedigree, you know, in terms of history. Um, you know, what kind of impact does history have in the design for your game? Sì, sì, è vero. Noi ci piace molto avere a che fare con la realtà. E io trovo personalmente che spesso la realtà sia storica che gli ambienti reali abbiano un fascino enorme a volte superiore a quello degli ambienti di fantasia e a volte la realtà sa essere soprattutto più terribile e più, mh, più crudele di quello che sa essere la fantasia. E a livello di design naturalmente influenza tantissimo lo sviluppo del gioco e mh, poi a noi piace utilizzare l'ambiente anche per raccontare qualcosa, quindi 
Eh, il gioco è ambientato nella campagna toscana, sono ambienti molto belli, estivi, sole, natura, e, e questo diciamo che è un po' lo specchio della gioventù della protagonista. Però allo stesso momento ci sono delle ombre oscure che, che, che rovinano diciamo, questa atmosfera e che sono le ombre che abbiamo anche all'interno della psiche della protagonista. So Martha is Dead looks stunning. I mean, I think we can all agree on that. And you've been very clear about everything that we're seeing is actually in game. Um, how long has the game been in development and kind of what can you say about the research and technology behind it? Sì, ehm, beh, intanto siamo molto soddisfatti del livello grafico che abbiamo raggiunto rispetto a The Town of Flight, abbiamo, siamo riusciti a fare un salto avanti importante, questo grazie anche al passaggio da Unity a Unreal Engine, che è stato fondamentale per riuscire a spingere il dettaglio a un livello superiore. Naturalmente anche l'hardware sia su PC che ovviamente eh, su console ci ha permesso nell'arco di questi cinque anni di sviluppo di, di, di incrementare sempre di più le aspettative a livello visivo e grazie anche naturalmente all'esperienza oggi insomma, siamo un team che rispetto a The Town of Flight un pochino di esperienza abbiamo quindi abbiamo saputo ottimizzare la progettazione del gioco per avere un impatto, un impatto grafico migliore diciamo che noi siamo un po' ossessionati dal dettaglio e nel senso che andiamo sempre ogni ambiente a lavorarlo, a rilavorarlo più volte perché pensiamo che l'insieme di piccoli dettagli che potrebbero sfuggire ad una prima occhiata restituiscano poi quel senso di reale e che credo e spero noi si riesca a rendere soprattutto perché noi lavoriamo nel nostro ambiente quindi io per verificare se l'atmosfera è quella giusta posso uscire dal mio studio e darmi un'occhiata in giro perché effettivamente eh, sono proprio le nostre zone, quelle che sono rappresentate nel gioco. Oh, well, th thank you so much for talking to us, uh, Luca. It looks beautiful. I can't wait to play it and uh, we'll see you very soon. Thank you so much. Grazie a te. Keeping up? Well, there's still a little ways to go, but we thought we'd just interject with a little special interlude for you all. So today, Wired are changing things up to announce Black Label, which is created to celebrate the work of the Wired family of developers new and old. Black Label will feature the best of the past and future releases, each limited to 2,000 copies worldwide. Let's take a look. everything breaking news wired have just launched wait for it a brand new website <laughs> go and check out wiredproductions.com and uh, make sure you register with the wired shop as they've got loads of exclusive stuff plus we're also going to bribe you to go there and buy things with some really cool money off vouchers head over to the shop right now using the promo code wired direct to get a whopping 20 percent off whatever you like Plus also, they're doing a single use. So like literally the, there's only one of these codes that's going to work. And the first person who goes to the website using the rather sweet Julia sent me can claim a free Deliver Us The Moon collector's edition. So go multi-tab like you have never multi-tab before and get there because first come, first served. Wait, how long can I? Last year saw the might of a new generation of hardware unleashed and with it came a particular Big Ass Bird, now BAFTA nominated game with the Falconeer taking flight. Developed by a single magnificent man and artist, Thomas Sala, it flipped what was thought possible by, you know, quote unquote indie teams. Since the launch, the game has seen continued updates and new content. I mean, there's motherfucking dragons now! And today, Thomas wanted to give you a little glimpse of what's happening next for the Falconeer.
Tomas, how are you doing? I'm excellent. Glad to be oh, here. Brilliant, brilliant. So we just saw some fantastic new content for the Falconeer. So first things first, when can we get our hands on it? Uh, it should be already there. I think uh, uh, we pressed the trigger just now. Press it now. And, Is uh, it on your desk? The button yeah, to go yeah, live. Well, like, uh, <laughs> it's 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 in in different room. But uh, <laughs> it should be propagating to whatever servers you're on. And uh, if you've got the Falconeer, you should now have the new content ready Ooh. to go. So not only is this new content free, it's available now, which is obviously amazing. But like, tell us a little bit more about it. Like, what are we going to be doing? Um, well, one of the things if you play the Falconeer, what happens is that if you go aggro on, on one of your uh, allies or just a trader, you start shooting around, uh, you'll be turned into a pirate or a criminal and you'll get hunted. <laughs> and But that's actually all there is. It's just you get hunted until you die and there's no proper uh, pathway for being a pirate in this world, which I always thought uh, is a bit of a shame. And that's something we've uh, I've been working to correct in this uh, in this in this update in this content. Uh, so now uh, there is uh, a way to become a pirate. There is a pirate town to visit. It's on the top a giant turtle, um, and you'll get to do piratey things. So uh, fly yeah. around, uh, take <laughs> down traders, take their loot, sell it, get wanted. Uh, bribe local officials to not be wanted if you want to get back into polite society uh, so that's one part of it that's why it's called the lost because then everybody who's not you know uh, is the lost in this world um so you get to do that and there is quite a bit of uh new mechanics that comes with that there's a legendary aces you get to uh fight so these are high level sort of uh enemies that are spec similar to the player who also shoots rockets, by the way. Uh, so there's quite a, quite a nice selection of new stuff. Oh, it sounds cool. And actually, even you know, later this year, we're going to get even more Falconer goodness with uh, the Edge of the World. So what does this particular expansion involve and kind of what will the player be doing? Well, the Edge of the World, uh, well, the name sort of, sort of uh, implies it. Um, uh, we have a very fixed map. Uh, yeah. well, we and the players, uh, the Falconer yeah. has a, a very fixed world map. Um, and one of the ideas was I wanted to do two things. So first of all, I wanted to add stories which aren't the main storyline. So I have little side quests, little adventures that sort of flesh out the world a little bit more. Uh, so there's going to be that. And those will lead to places which are on the boundaries of the world map. So we're going to see the world map just go from this, zoom out a little bit and find places which are on the periphery of the civilized world so to speak insofar anything is civilized so you recently nominated for a BAFTA Games Award that's got to feel pretty awesome like I mean not to put words in your mouth but it must be awesome right I'm never going to get a BAFTA that must be pretty cool <laughs> it, it is really it, it's 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 quite bloody cool I can't uh, yeah it's, it's, uh, <laughs> yes. uh, it's pretty amazing so it's uh, yeah 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 I, I, did you tell people? Who did you phone? I would have called up everyone I went to school with and be like, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> I did put it in my Twitter bio. <laughs> well, actually, uh, uh, ah. local television came by, uh, gave a little interview, and I watched it back and went, I was horrified because it just looked like a, a furry <laughs> sheepdog on television. And then someone on, the, on, on Twitter said, ah, a BAFTA nominated furry sheepdog. And I went, yeah. That's yeah. Cool. You so, can be uh, anything as long as you have BAFTA <laughs> nominated in front of it. It yeah, makes like, fine, right? Yeah, BAFTA nominated cakes. It's excellent. Yes, everything's uh, great. It's so yeah. <laughs> it's 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 now. I, I am BAFTA nominated. You're BAFTA. Everybody's BAFTA. Nominated. I'm not. <laughs> don't bring this up. I said I wasn't going to get one. Come on, they don't do best hair. They don't. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> they should. They uh, should. So, no, yeah, it's 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 a lovely label to have, and you know for a game that is uh, 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 such a, a special niche type of thing, uh, mm -mm. that is quite quite the acknowledgement. Thomas, thank you so much for joining us. It's been really, really great. And uh, looking forward to all the new content you've got coming out. Oh, uh, thanks. It's time now for another brand new exclusive reveal. The next game is a sequel to a game that had over 25 million players push their tiny troops through their paces to victory. 
Prepare to take on massive global battles and daring missions beyond enemy lines. Buckle up, soldier. It's time to take on and answer the call of duty and smash onto the battlefield. Wyatt. Super villains are causing global chaos. So shoot up, soldiers. It's time to answer the call of duty. Lock and low. Miss Dudes, eat my dirt. Stay frosty. Time to get back into action. Tiny Troopers Global Up. Now, after that news, we need to find out a little bit more, right? Let's bring in Kevin Leathers, lead producer at Wired Productions. So, hey, Kevin, how are you doing? I'm fine. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm really good. Uh, excited to be talking about Tiny Troopers. I distinctly remember this game from before. And, like, it's been really interesting to find out. You know, obviously, there's 25 you know, million players and, like, a really super engaged community. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, like, obviously, that was kind of before. Like, what's the kind of journey from then to now? Like, how have we got to this point? Um, well, as I say, there's a huge community for Time Troopers, which is something that we really wanted to grow, really wanted to bring uh, to everyone. Yeah. Uh, since the first game back in 2012, um, Tiny Troopers, and then obviously number two, then Join Tops that we uh, bought at the PlayStation, uh, all the way up to bringing the Xbox and Switch, and um, it's been an exciting journey, and we're hoping to bring it further, bring it, bring it more, bring it bigger, bring it more yes. exciting. Excellent. All the right words, definitely. And um, you're working with um, Epiphany Games on this. So tell us sort of like how this collaboration came about, like, you know, uh, and what can they bring to the franchise? Um, well, Epiphany have been working with us on Tiny Troopers for quite a few years now. Um, yeah. And they have helped us make additional content for Joint Tops, as well as uh, doing the Xbox and Switch versions. So oh, they have actually uh, brought in a huge amount of, they, they have worked with the game for quite a while. Mm. They know the brands, they know yeah. the game, they know the insides and outs, and they know absolutely everything. What, the, what makes the game tick, what makes it fun, what makes it exciting. Mm. And we, they are a perfect fit to bring, hopefully, some brand spanking new uh, that everyone will find incredibly enjoyable. Oh, cool. Well, it sounds like a good partnership we've got going on there. Um, yes. So, I mean, obviously, Tiny Troopers is about, you know, it's about action-packed gameplay and kind of fast-paced arcade fun and the hijinks and, like, the heat of the battle, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, for the first time now, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, uh, Tiny Troopers is a game that's being built, you know, multiplayer first. Yes. So that's exciting. But, like, oh, yeah. what does that mean, really? And, like, what can gamers look forward to? Well, one thing we felt that was missing from Joint Ops was the ability to play with friends, the ability to form squads, and um, to actually do yeah. go for the really military sort of thing. So the natural yeah. evolution of that is the co-op. So we want to go co-op with a brand new version of Time Troopers. We want to bring it local. We want to bring it online. We want people to drop in and out. We want the entire experience to be played alone yeah. or with friends and actually have a really good time, no matter how you want to play the game. I mean, I feel like every single game needs to have a couch co-op version. I mean, what else Damn can straight. we do at Damn the moment? Straight. Nothing. We can't go outside. We want to be safe. Play more video <laughs> games, right? <laughs> Damn straight. And you want a game that you can play with everyone. So this this will be yeah. the perfect thing that you can play locally. Or if your family really sucks at a the game, then take a while life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're not talking about Call of Duty here. We are talking about a kind of instantly uh, accessible game yes. surrounded, you know, and in case kind of in humour and fun. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that kind of fun side to it? Well, that's the thing about it. With games such as Call of Duty, it's a seriousness, it's gruff men doing gruff things, firing gruff guns, if guns are gruff. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is the main thing, is the game is accessible, it's fun, it's exciting, it's colourful. It's everything you want it to be, and it's everything that you can easily pick up, go, I know what I'm doing, I'm going to shoot, shoot some things with the soldiers, yep. and that's it, straight into it. And that's the main thing we want to go for. This is not a, a hero sort of thing where yeah. the hero is taking on legions of enemies because that's what he does. This is about little tiny soldiers, it's in the name, yeah. um, going through different theatres of war, but showing that war treats their soldiers as disposable commodities as well. Yeah. We're doing it in a fun way, and... Yeah making sure that people can can just play it, just can pick up, play, and just get straight into it. I have a feeling that this game is going to, like, 
bring families together, but then also kind of split them apart at the same time. <laughs> so it's anything like my family would be like, oh, let's be wholesome. Let's play a game together. And then I'm like, why, God, why did you do that? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, I can't say we're not going to have that. Um, <laughs> probably help force that a bit more, really, as well. But it will, it will still be a fun experience. And it'll be one of those games where you can play with people locally as well, but everything yeah. you do singly or with a team all works together as well. So no matter how badly someone does win doing in cold, <laughs> you'll be able Eject to them from the squad. Eject just, them just, from the squad. Just chuck them out of the room and then just carry on the fun. <laughs> That's great advice. I shall take forward <laughs> when I play the game. Well, look, thank you so, so much for talking to us. I'm really excited to uh, get my hands on the gameplay and uh, yeah, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Space, the final frontier. Well, no, for the team at Kaoken Interactive, it was kind of just the beginning. First releasing Deliver Us the Moon in 2018 through Early Access, the developers teamed up with Wired to finish the project and launch it on consoles. And after receiving critical acclaim with Wired support, they reached for the stars and found RTX. The PC version of Deliver Us the Moon showed us what was achievable with technology and how indie storytellers could also be trendsetters, being one of the first titles to fully embrace the technology and become a key partner with NVIDIA. Well, Houston has called, and the team have been working hard on delivering the ultimate payload. Let's see what they've been up to. Remember 2018, where you could go outside and be in the proximity of other people and brush past them without them shooting you a really evil side eye. Good times. It also saw the release of the Nintendo Switch gem Vostok Inc, which caught the eye of legendary Smash Brothers and Kirby director Masahiro Sakurai, who praised its addictive gameplay. I think they're um, still waiting for that invitation as a uh, you know, Smash, maybe? Sakurai son? Anyway, since then, Nosebleed have been hard at work on their next masterpiece. It's time to head back to 1993 and head down to the arcade for a very, very literal rags to Rich's adventure. Wired. Enter a gaming paradise where there's zero sun and maximum fun! Ar Ar arcade Paradise! We've got over 35 awesome arcade hits hungry for your quarters! Experience skull-shaking extreme stereo sound! Get your face melted by insane graphics! Wow, they're so real! Smash your rivals, dominate the high score table, and become a legend! You won't play games that look this good at home until 2021! So don't be a dweeb! Come on down to the new... Hello. Please leave your message after the tone. Ashley, hello. I approved your proposal to convert the utility room and extend the King Laundry trading area. More space, more washing machines. It's a little obvious, but fine. Hopefully by now you appreciate the Laundry's vital role in the community, and the modest but steady income it provides. Reinvestment is a sure path to success. Just don't do anything stupid. So we thought we'd bring in Dre, who's the head honcho from Nosebleed, to tell us a little bit more about the game. Hey, Dre, how you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Excited to be talking about uh, Arcade Paradise. Yeah, I bet. So, um, obviously from the title, I think on first glance, people are just like, oh, it's just an arcade like simulator thing. But it's not. There's a kind of extra layers to it on top. So can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot, to, a lot more to it than just being an arcade collection. So. You play Ashley, a sort of late teens, early twenties character, 
Uh, you're working in this dead end job um, at your dad's like laundrette. Who, your dad actually, incidentally, is voiced by Doug Cockle, whose voice you might recognise. The Witcher. Yeah, yeah, from Victor Fram and Geralt the Witch, the Witcher. Um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, very cool. Um, that was a fun recording session. Um, yeah, and oh, this laundrette has like a few arcade machines in the sort of grubby back room, like two or three arcade machines. And it turns out that these machines are making more money than the laundrette itself. So. Uh, Basically, your your raison d'etre is to turn this uh, laundrette into this huge paradise of arcade games, basically. And so alongside kind of playing the, the 35 plus, I've actually lost count, more than 35, let's say, yeah. um, arcade games when we launch. Um, you'll also be doing a whole bunch of other stuff like these kind of crappy dead end jobs, um, you know, picking up litter, unclogging toilets, that sort of stuff. But we've tried to make everything really gamey and tactile. So yeah, there's okay. there's a lot more to it. There's a kind of storyline, there's this kind of sense of proper progression. And uh, yeah, it's very much a nosebleed game, let's say. <laughs> I mean, after Boss Talk Inc, obviously, Arcade Paradise is your second game uh, with Wild Productions. So does it kind of feel like, you know, you're getting the band back together or did you never really kind of split up? Uh, I would say we've never really split up. I mean, with with Aww. Vostok, with yeah, I mean definitely Aww. with with Vostok, um, our previous game with Wired, they basically helped us get an existing title onto Nintendo Switch. It was or it was already a finished game by the time we kind of got with Wired. With Arcade Paradise, they've been there right from the very start. In actual fact, the, the kind of the seed of an idea came from a conversation at a show when those things were still in existence but um but so yeah, i don't so... understand what that is outside <laughs> with people around me yeah no exactly idea. exactly uh but in all honesty it's been really good i mean they've given us total creative freedom and, and it's nice. been really good to have like a, a second opinions and, and people to kind of bounce ideas off of and also really good to have a, a publisher that we can kind of lean on when we would like specific things that we might not be able to do ourselves so for example <laughs> getting doug to be my dad <laughs> oh that's so wholesome <laughs> yeah it's been really good it's, it's 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 been it's been a really good sort of collaborative approach to, to game making as well that's that's really nice so yeah yeah definitely the back it's not even so much as getting the band back together it's like getting into the studio and doing the proper like the sophomore big album. album yeah yeah <laughs> that's it that's it <laughs> So you've called it Arcade Paradise, but like, if I'm having to clean toilets, this is not really selling the dream of an Arcade Paradise. I'm sure there's a reason, but also I want to know when it went out. So if you could answer those two questions, that would be useful. Thanks. Yeah, sure thing. I mean, obvious, obviously, outside of the fact that we've created this kind of paradise for gamers who, who like arcade games and, and other types of games, um, We've also all really had crappy dead end jobs, I think. And part of part of the game is about <laughs> oh like God, breaking yeah. out of that kind of crappy dead end job. There's a specific reason yeah. for the name actually that's that's kind of okay. quite heavily linked with the story. But we'll we'll leave that for players okay. to discover. Um, right. But yeah, like all of our games, we want this one to be kind of really generous. So you know, when you buy it, you're not just buying one thing; you're buying like a really big, generous kind of package. And like all our games as well that have that like i'll just play for 10 minutes and then three hours later you're like whoa what's happened to the time and you know getting that right takes takes time but i'm pleased mm. to say it'll be this year so 2021 where's my hover car i know 2021 i want a hover car this futuristic dystopia is rubbish. Yeah, yeah. It is rubbish. They didn't just tell us it was going to be watching Netflix until we get wispy beards. Yeah, I would mind never you. have bought into that. I I do not have long hair, but I've not had a I've not had a haircut since lockdown, and this is like my you're fully yeah, lockdown it. hair. Yeah, I'm going I'm to have a big beard as well, but I've decided to trim it for for this. Well, you know you're on a good stead and good footing when like your hair can grow into your beard. You can like comb <laughs> yeah, it through yeah, almost, yeah, like that, to make one giant one. Um, so obviously we saw a teaser for what looked like, you know, uh, a Vostok uh, Inc. sequel, basically, in the run up to today's event. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about this? And are we going to see any more of like Jimmy Goldman? Maybe? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so Vostok, uh, Vostok 2093 is a direct sequel to Vostok. 2084, ah. which if you <laughs> played Vostok Inc. Is, is one of the kind of unlockable games in that. So uh, it's very much a souped up version of that top down shooter with kind of, again, its own progress systems, kind of loads more weapons and this, that and the other. 
So yeah, it's, it's definitely a nod to the uh, to the to the Vostok fans. Uh, yeah, to the Vostok fans out there. As for Jimmy, you know, all the nosebleed games take place in the same universe. So who knows? <laughs> Wink. <laughs> Who knows? Well, alluding. There we go. I love it. Well, look, Jay, thank you so, so much for joining us. Uh, it's a real pleasure to hear more about this kind of, I, I, I'm getting like this kind of like Archer-esque vibe, the whole like laundromat, like going, maybe you didn't watch Archer, but you know, you like go I into- I didn't, I'll be honest. You're not. <laughs> so basically their, play, their, 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 their spy place is hidden within a laundrette. That was like the first uh, thing I thought of. Uh, so, yeah, maybe, I mean, maybe Archer crossover. To be honest, it reminds me of one of the arcades that my brother, so I've got an old brother and he took me to this arcade when I was at school and it was just, it was like the back of this video shop and there were like six yeah. arcades in there, including Robocop. And it was just grubby and grim. But like, that's that's kind of, that's where you start. It's just this back room, it's got no yeah. wallpaper, it's just like, you know, bare lights and like concrete walls and like three arcade machines. And then, you know, it grows out into like this fully neon, beautiful, nicely lit kind of place that's your own. Oh, so, yeah. so you, were, you were lucky. <laughs> Most of us just had like a street fighter thing and like a chip shop or cab office or something going on. So that was, that was it, oh, that was have, the arcade. We didn't have street fighter. They had, uh, what I remember is Rolling Thunder, Robocop. And they had like, I think they had one Astro Cab maybe. Yeah. With some. I think it was probably a Japanese ROM as well, if I remember right. But yeah, this is like, this is where the game's inspiration comes from. These like hazy memories of the early nineties, me being like, right, I'll, I'll not have my lunch. I'll just use my lunch money to, you know, play Robocop for like 30 seconds. Okay, I've got one final question, which is totally off script, but I'm going to ask you it anyway, right? Okay, no if I could say like right now, I can put any arcade cabinet in your house, you can have it, what would you have? Ooh, well, we've got an money, money, no object. We've got an arcade machine in the in the office that has got Windjammers on it, and Windjammers yeah. is probably the most played game in the office. But <laughs> given we already have that, I reckon it'd have to be like one of the totally ridiculous like sit-in cabinets, like uh, G Lock. You know, the, remember the Sega one that span around in three hundred and sixty degrees. After Burner, they had a three hundred and sixty oh, upside Burner down. After was really good as well. Right? Yeah, yeah. In Trocadero, and it would like cost three pounds, and I couldn't land the plane ever, but I didn't care because <laughs> I'd crash at the end. But you I get to never, spin around. I never played that game because it was a too expensive, and b you had to like go to specific places. And you know, I, I did see it once, and it was like, oh, I really want to go in it, but I can't afford it. I just it. used to spin around upside down for like a few <laughs> minutes make and then crash. Sick. Yeah, that's. <laughs> Great, that's the best kind of arcade okay, game for the topic. Oh, well, look, Dre, thank you so, so much for chatting to us. Uh, we can't wait to see more and uh, yeah, speak to you soon. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Well, that's a wrap for the first ever Wired Direct. Thank you so, so much, Dre. Who am I kidding? There is always one more thing. Cue the video. Wired are so stoked to reveal the last worker and we're going to be sharing more information as I'm sure you have a lot more questions. And that's it for Wired Direct 2021. Over the next week, we'll be celebrating with deep dives on many of the games that are announced today. In the meantime, you can check out the latest issue of Edge magazine for some exclusive The Last Worker artwork. And please hit the follow or subscribe button wherever you are watching this to make sure you're the first to know about our eclectic family of games. From everyone here at Wired and myself, thank you so, so much for joining us and do go and head to Steam to wishlist all these games via the links below. Make sure you keep safe wherever you are and don't worry, it's not going to be long till we get to do these things in person and we for one can't wait. See you soon.